Let's see. And I do. I have a copy, Patrick. You probably do too, but I have a. I have I a do. copy here. Okay. With this so, gorgeous color cover, I should have worn my my matching um, top, but I didn't. Didn't they I do a I'd beautiful be... job on that? I love yeah, it. it is. It's I lovely. love it. Yeah. So we're live. Do you want to go ahead and do the the thing, or? No, you go ahead. You've got a book. I'll do my spiel. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And we're really delighted to have our good friend Deanna Rayborn back with us, albeit virtually. Hopefully soon it'll be in person again. Um, she's going to be talking about her brand new book, An Impossible Imposter. I love that. And uh, Deanna signed a bunch of them. And uh, I'll go ahead and put a link in the comments field if you're interested in ordering one before they disappear. And actually, they've almost already disappeared, haven't they, Barbara? We don't <laughs> have that many left. <laughs> yeah. So act now. Um, and if you have questions for Deanna, go ahead and put them in the comments or questions field on YouTube or Facebook. And Barbara will summon me back on screen here towards the end of the hour. So Barbara, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Patrick. It's so much fun. It's so much power to do this summoning thing. I feel like I'm doing some kind of magic <laughs> act. Lovely. So a toast to you, Deanna. Oh, I will. I will toast you with my peppermint tea. I understand. <laughs> I like our events to be BYOB. So at least in the, in the evening. Oh, but. you know, I've got our spring allergens are already creeping out. And so I've got the spring wheeze starting early this year. So I thought instead of hacking and coughing all over you, I'd get some peppermint tea and try to act like a lady. Oh, what a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so I love Deanna's background. She tells me she's remodeling her office, but she has this nifty little sort of um, teaser going on there behind us. So it's very exciting. I do. My little, right. my little uh, fairy lights and vines. Yes. I'm so happy to be here. I love my poison pen events. Well, thank you very much. This is lucky number seven for Veronica Speedwell and Stover. It is. So once again, a toast to that after I have a second toast. <laughs> they told me at the Mayo Clinic, because you know, now that I'm old, I have to go in and have things checked, that my voice will do better if I drink. They didn't specify well, what, but um, <laughs> cheers to you. But the object is to um, you know, um, hydrate, <clears throat> excuse me, the vocal Absolutely. cords and see how they go. So I have to go in for some weird stretching exercise fairly soon. So I'm not sure how that works. But anyway, this gorgeous cover, um, and it's a wonderful title. I like The Impossible Imposter. It's euphonious. So is this your yes. title, Deanna? Did you dream this one up? I think this one actually is a title that I came up with. Um, you know, the titles are always kind of hit or miss, whether my working title stays with the book or whether it doesn't. And usually we know pretty early on if the, if the title works, um, because it's, it's, you know, art department wants it to be able to fit on the cover and sales and marketing don't want to have, you know, be tripping over their tongue when they're trying to describe it to people. So they need something that flows. And uh, sometimes I give them my very first Veronica book, ended up being pubbed under A Curious Beginning, which yep. was not the working title. The working title was The Unlikely Adventures of Veronica Speedwell, Volume 1. And they said, absolutely not. Um, so I, I, I gave in with good grace. But uh, about half the time, the working title ends up on the cover. And the other half the time, uh, someone in the office will suggest something and it works out beautifully. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. I've got the Berkeley team kind of, you know, doing their thing and working their magic for Veronica. So this is the most first one that's alliterative. So just for <laughs> pressure, in case you don't know the series, I will read off the titles of the first six books. A Curious Beginning, A Perilous Undertaking, A Treacherous Curse, A Dangerous Collaboration. I really love that one. That might be what we're actually doing at the moment. <laughs> A Murderous Relation and An Unexpected Peril. So you mm -hmm. can see that an impossible imposter, you know, has a has a ring of its own. So this in its way is a is a bit of an homage to Rebecca, whether you actually attended that or not. But nevertheless, we have one of those wonderful English kind of, you know, country estates and it's in remote Devonshire. We we both agreed that that's probably where this one is after a little thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, not Cornwall, but you know, Devin not Cornwall. Versus, I've done a yeah. Cornish book. I've had a Cornish book, so this is this was you know time to go up the peninsula a little bit. 
Right. But, you know, the, the action works really well in, in that kind of environment. It's a bit of Agatha mm -hmm. Christie in the sense that it's a closed country house. It's a bit right. of Rebecca because it's got a gothic element. And then it's uniquely Deanna Rayburn um, writing her two characters. But um, what, what really is interesting about this book is the real history that underpins um, much of the of the point of the story. So want to tell us about the actual event that triggered this off? Well, it was, you know, this book was born out of about four or five different things that I had swirling around in my head that all kind of came together at one time. Um, one of them was I've doled out little bits and pieces of Veronica's past through the earlier books. And one of, you know, I, I it's kind of a running joke now. You know, she was kidnapped by Corsican bandits. She was shipwrecked with a, a Chinese monk and she was in the eruption of Krakatoa. So at some point I wanted to deal with the fact that Veronica had been in that part of the world when Krakatoa erupted a few years before we meet Veronica. So that was going on. That's one little piece of the puzzle. Another one is um, the very first mystery I ever remember reading was Hound of the Baskervilles. And, you know, that it's still my favorite Sherlock Holmes to this day because it was just so atmospheric, even though it's the one that Holmes is in probably the least. I loved, loved, loved the setting of it. And so I always swore I was going to do a Dartmoor book. I had to do a Dartmoor book, but I didn't want it to be Holmesian. I wanted it to have its own kind of vibe. So the setting was definitely an homage. And of course, Rebecca for years was my go to travel book. You know, before we all started traveling with Kindles and you could take like 700 books with you at one time, I would take always, and I still do travel with two backup paper books always, but I would always have a copy of Rebecca in my carry-on bag wherever I went. That was my fallback novel, my comfort reading. And then there was this really fantastic case in Victorian London that just blew my mind. And I've, I've, I've had it kind of, you know, twirling around back there for a really long time. In the middle of Victoria's reign, there is um, the heir to a fortune who has disappeared in a shipwreck, allegedly, and the family grieves, they move on with their lives. And about 10 years later, a man shows up claiming to be the lost heir to this fortune. And it became just this massive news story. It gripped the country. Everybody had an opinion. Is he telling the truth? Is he not? Because he looked nothing like the guy he claimed to be. He was inches taller. He was about 150 pounds heavier. Um, but he did have a couple of little physical peculiarities in common. And he seemed to know some things that only the missing heir could know. So the, the mother who had lost her son claimed him and said, yes, this is my boy. Um, the brother who had inherited the estate without him said, not so fast. I want to keep my inheritance. And so it went, it wound its way through the court system and everybody took sides. Everybody kind of chose, you know, and were you on the side of, of this possible imposter or were you on the side of the, the members of the family who weren't quite so ready to believe his story? And so it ended up just becoming this really incredible case that everybody wrote about, everybody read about. It was in all the newspapers. And it was, um, it's just one of those things that I've always thought was just a really interesting quirk of history because it would be such a difficult thing to do now with DNA and fingerprints and exactly. you know all of this other stuff. But in the Victorian times, it wasn't that difficult to reinvent yourself. Uh, and it turns out this guy did absolutely reinvent himself. He was a butcher from like Wagga Wagga, Australia or something. And so he ended up claiming to be the heir to a fortune and he had no right to it whatsoever, but it got me wondering how easy it might be to get away with that if you were of a mind to do that or how difficult would it be if you were the person who had been through some terrible ordeal coming home and people didn't believe you. Yeah. That would be devastating. And how do you prove that you are who you say you are? So I wanted to, to deal with both ends of, of that particular uh, puzzle. And so it all kind of came together in this. Uh, and I wanted, to, I wanted to throw in a thylacine, uh, which is a Tasmanian tiger. I wanted Stoker to have a Tasmanian tiger at some point. <laughs> you knew so you were going to get to the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The, the tiger is the hook. No surprise here. The for tiger Stoker, is the hook. You know? yeah, the um, tiger is the hook who absolutely leaps at the idea of being able to reclaim this unfortunate 
Tiger. That's how you Tiger. bribe Stoker to get him to do anything you want, is you promise him a rare and unusual mount. And this thylacine is it. Absolutely. But, you know, to go, to go way back, uh, what we know about both Stoker and Veronica is that they are both illegitimate, um, you know, which is, um, we don't know it at the outset, but it's gradually revealed to us. So they have, they have a bond because they didn't start out in a romantic relationship, but any, right. any, anybody with any intuition could see it was going <laughs> to go in that direction. But possibly even you, Deanna, realized from the beginning that it was going to go in that direction. But anyway, um, you know, the fact that they're both illegitimate um, and they both have wanderlust and they both are dedicated to natural science, which, you know, was an enormous thing in the Victorian era, you know, naturalists of all kinds. So Stoker, you know, does his thing with taxidermy and all the rest of it. Veronica, we know is, you know, the butterfly thing. And, you know, it, it, it's a little, I don't know today whether, whether we would feel quite so ready to embrace collecting butterflies. Do you think, do you think that that's something um, that's kind of passed with the Victorian age? Absolutely. Um, there's a, a wonderful, um, young woman who I follow on Instagram, who is a, uh, she mounts butterflies to sell. And she always makes it very, very clear in every one of her posts that these butterflies are collected after death. They are never, they're not netted. They're not killed. They're allowed to live their full normal lifespan. And then all she does is preserve them once they die of natural causes. Um, and, and it is something that, that has occurred to me working through the series. And so Veronica and Stoker, have actually both wrestled with that question. Yeah. And Stoker is very much on the forefront of kind of the conservation movement within natural history, which is not, we need to go out and kill everything because we learn in, in Stoker's past, he has done that. that. Because that was actually what natural historians were doing at the time. They were going out into the field, they would shoot a specimen themselves, they'd field dress it, take it back to a museum, you know, taxidermy it, put it into a display, and Stoker's the, the, one of the first people, and, and it was absolutely happening at the end of the 19th century, that you had natural historians who were saying, should we? Should we really do that? And so really what Stoker's doing now is he is rehabilitating mounts that were very badly done to start with and, and putting them back, kind of bringing dignity back to this specimen saying, okay, we need to, we need to honor this animal and, and make it look its best. And we need to use this as an educational tool so people understand, oh, hey, this is what this animal looks like. I don't need to go shoot one of my own. Here's one. I don't need to stick one in a zoo. I don't, you know, I need to make sure that I help preserve this animal's habitat. Um, and so that movement, you know, people always tend to think that that's a thing that was like maybe late 20th century, and it's not. The Victorians were absolutely already starting to think about that. And, you know, Veronica has kind of gone back and forth about whether she will net a specimen or not and several times in the series we see her let one go or just not mm -hmm. net it in the first place and just instead watch it fly off um and she has her vivarium now that stoker has um kind of rehabilitated for her out of this wrecked glass house where they live and she's able to raise her own um which i've done and it's nasty you think butterflies are beautiful but they're gross I love them, but they're gross. They smell awful. Um, but she has these, these gorgeous butterflies that she can watch, you know, larva, chrysalis right. emerging, and then their natural lifespan, and then they die, and she can, you know, she can uh, mount them at that point. So she's, she's actually taking care not to do as much hunting in the field as she used to, um, which, you know, I, I think makes them a little bit more palatable to modern readers, hopefully. Well, you know, part of the part of the whole point of her going off with her net was that it gave her a chance to go to all these exotic foreign places. And um, what in order it was lucrative. I mean, that's the other thing. Well, it was literally sure. how she earned a living. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's 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 it was um, it was because Veronica and I've told you this story many times that Veronica is loosely based. You know, she's inspired on a real woman who actually earned a very good living doing this because it was a respectable occupation for a woman to have. You could still present yourself as being fairly ladylike. 
as opposed to, you know, oh, I, I work in a shop or, you know, it, it was considered to be a genteel occupation. So she could still present herself as a lady, even though she's earning money. Um, th- she would have been in a gray area in that regard, kind of like governesses were, um, you know, not quite, not quite fish nor fowl. Um, and so Veronica has, has had to support herself since the age of 18. And this was a way of doing it that enabled her to travel. It enabled her to be her own boss and make her own decisions. Um, and it also kept her fed and clothed. Um, and it, it gave her rollicking adventures all around the world. So for her, it was just, it was a, a win all the way around. And now she has a salary from her employment, uh, you know, from the Earl of Rosemorin. So she's, she's got income. And she's not quite as dependent on uh, on going out and trekking around hunting butterflies. No, but she misses it. I mean, I think it's hard for a spirit like her, you know, yeah. not to not to be out in the field at least some of the time. And and that's apparent in this book. There's kind of a pulse of that, you know, that that yeah. both of them, in fact, you know, um, they're they're not really domesticated, fully domesticated human beings. And they're so they're not neither no. one. But you know, I mean, you and I both love to travel and. You know, that that to me has has always been one of the challenging things in my life. If there are circumstances which mean that I can't travel for a while, I always I start to feel a little a little bit caged and uh, a little bit restless. And, you know, for me, being able to to kind of get out into a new environment and have a little bit of an adventure, it hits the reset button. And, you know, for Veronica and Stoker, they have that to the nth degree Um, and their travel is so much more you know, it pushes the boundary so much more than, than what the average Victorian was getting up to, uh, that, you know, they, they, uh, you're absolutely right. They're not fully domesticated. No, but you know, it's part of the reason they speak the same language. Well, absolutely. But I mean, there was a whole group of Victorians to whom, you mm-hmm. know, the empire provided them with like a world stage and, absolutely. um, you know, and basically a passport, because if you had a British passport, you could go mm-hmm. practically anywhere. Um, Absolutely. And if you had enough funds, you know, so it was a, especially for younger sons like Stoker mm-hmm. um, or women like Veronica, who didn't want to like be a governess or a lady's companion or whatever. Um, you know, that kind of travel was an escape from the confines, very mm-hmm. straight confines of Victorian society, which, um, you know, when you didn't fit in from natural inclination, it would have really... Mm-hmm encouraged you to do that so the what happens when this book starts they're recovering from the alpenwald which was her <laughs> last book where veronica yeah. impersonated the ruler so she was briefly mm-hmm. royalty briefly wore the Brief royal royalty. jewels the whole yes. bit which was really fun um but you know but that was a pretty exhausting um and emotionally difficult adventure for them and was, now they trying. get a summons from, well, you tell it, it's your book. Who did they get a summons from <laughs> uh, to come to London? And Pardon me. he has a um, mission for them. Yes. Sir Hugo Montgomery, bless his heart. Um, he is what I am now terming their frenemy. Uh, he is their, their sometime ally, their occasional opponent. Um, Sir Hugo is the head of special branch at Scotland Yard. Um, Sir Hugo is fictitious, but special branch is not. Special branch has existed um, since a few decades before Veronica and Stoker's uh, stories get going. And it is the precursor to MI5. They are tasked with uh, a lot of very kind of delicate and secret missions. And one of the things they were responsible for is um, the safety and security of the royal family. Um, you know, beyond what the, the particular regiments were taking care of, they were the ones who were, uh, you know, when a head of state would come and visit Special Branch would be the ones who would, who would kind of look out for all of the security details. And so Sir Hugo has um, come to Veronica and said, I need a favor from you, but it's a special favor just for me privately. Um, and so Veronica, of course, is always up for an adventure. So she hops right on board. Stoker has to be bribed as ever because poor Stoker is the one who usually bears the brunt of their adventures. He's been shot. He's been stabbed. He's been nearly drowned. He's been manacled. Um, I beat poor Stoker up almost every book. Um, and so he, he reluctantly agrees to help her um, as long as he can get his hands on this elusive and very special Tasmanian tiger, a thylacine. 
which is his dearest wish in the world. So they travel to um, a country estate on the edge of Dartmoor because Sir Hugo is afraid that the young man who has turned up pretending to be the heir to an estate is not who he claims to be. And Sir Hugo's link to this is this young man would be the older brother of his goddaughter, his, uh, his much loved and kind of wayward goddaughter. So he wants Veronica because Veronica, if this young man is telling the truth, Veronica would have known him on her travels. And so he feels like he can prevail upon Veronica to go in and, and do her usual um, meddlesome things and find out the truth for him. So I will add any of you who read Ann Perry's Victorian Mysteries know that Thomas Pitt rose to be the head of special branch um, in, in her books, um, migrating up from a fairly low job in the police force, you know, to this it can, and really there was nowhere higher for somebody like that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they were the ones spearheading the Jack the Ripper investigation. I mean, this was, you know, as high as you could possibly get at the Metropolitan Police Force. So, well, so Sir yeah. Hugo is a good person to know, but, uh, but you know, you want to keep him on your good side. So that's part of the reason Veronica's inclined to, to help him out. Oh, yeah, because absolutely. She, crossed wants, swords you know, with she him wants him to owe her a favor. Um, for you once. Know, rather than the... Other way around. So what we have, um, we we arrive here, and interestingly enough, the young man who's come back is not trying to claim the estate. What happened was, you know, those of you who remember Downton Abbey will recall that in the first season, when the presumed heir goes down on the Titanic, is the way I remember it, and suddenly there's a new a new man who is going to be the heir to Downton. And the reason is that the estate is entailed. So it has to pass mm -hmm. from one male heir to another male heir, generally the oldest of that generation. It was pretty rare that the estates were entailed on women. And it was a way to protect property. You know, that's how these big estates managed to hold together and transfer in because people were not allowed to break them up. And, and in season two of Downton, proving that Julian didn't, Julian Fellows didn't actually do his homework when they were faced with economic hardship, they started discussing selling Downton. And right then they lost me because, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> but, um, so what's happened here in, in the hall that we're talking about is that um, uh, the, the man who owned it, was either either broke the entail or didn't have an entail and wrote a will passing on his estate in the hall to the second and thought to be surviving son. So yeah, the there was no back, entail. Yeah, yeah there was the no guy entail. that comes back doesn't actually, he can't oust his brother and his brother's family uh, because of an entail. But of course, you know, there may be a moral obligation. You know, what do you do? Do you give him a place to live? Is he always mm -hmm. going to be the uncomfortable specter at the feast? Does he exactly. need an allowance? You know, what, what's going to happen? Um, because, you know, let's face it, those guys were not brought up to work. I mean, they, they no, exactly. did not have a profession. So you couldn't say, well, he can come back and, you know, he can go off and practice law or be a librarian or, you know, a zookeeper. I mean, it just doesn't work out that way. So if, if in fact, he is who he says he is, it presents both a moral and a financial dilemma for the second son and his family. And is it, if I remember, it's the second son that's married to Sir Hugh's goddaughter. Is that how that goes? No, there, there were actually three children. There are the two sons, and then uh, the youngest is the daughter, but who is Sir Hugo's goddaughter. Oh, okay. So she's the sister mm -hmm. of the- She's the sister. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And I deliberately wrote it where there was no entail specifically because of that issue. Uh, because right. I knew if there's an entail, then we're immediately into court territory. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't want to go there because I thought it would be more interesting to play with it if it's just a matter of what do you owe morally? Right. You know, what, what, what is your obligation? Especially because in this case, we have a young man who has never once claimed to be Jonathan Hathaway. He's an amnesiac. It's the grandmother who's saying, oh, this is my beloved grandson, come home. He's turned up with no memory of who he is, just paperwork saying he's Jonathan Hathaway and he resembles Jonathan Hathaway. And so since they haven't seen him in a number of years, it's the grandmother who says, this is my grandson. He's not making claims on the estate. And so that gives a nice, very murky area to play in, I thought. 
So Jonathan, if it is indeed Jonathan, died in a natural disaster, which is the explosion of Krakatoa, which was such mm -hmm. a, a, an astonishing volcanic event that it blanketed the earth and changed the climate for a while and all the rest of it. Now, interestingly, Deanna, a couple of weeks ago, um, Stephanie Barron, aka Francine Matthews, was here with her Jane Austen mm -hmm. book. Jane and Which I blurbed. Her. I loved that. Yep. Book. Um, and it's not Krakatoa, but a different mm -hmm. volcano in Indonesia that, that has mm -hmm. erupted and caused um, a worldwide kind of blackout because of the huge ash clouds and so forth clouding the sun. Mm -hmm. But Krakatoa was was a disaster. And, you know, Deanna reminded me that the thing that, that reminded me of here was after 9-11, there were some cases, um, at least one I can remember, where um, it wasn't clear who died and who survived and whether mm -hmm. somebody emerging from the wreckage, so to speak, could claim to be somebody who, who did die. In fact, I think, I think there was at least one scam when that happened. Yeah, it's one of those things that tends to happen. Anytime you have a large scale disaster, someone will find an opportunity either to appear or to disappear. And that's what I always think is really, really fascinating is the idea that you would seize that because you can't predict these things. Right. I mean, you can predict a volcanic eruption now. You certainly couldn't when Krakatoa blew. And so how do you choose to suddenly seize upon this moment to vanish out of your own life or to pop up and decide you're suddenly going to claim to be somebody that you never were. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me, the, the kind of the psychological uh, areas that people will get into, you know, the, the lanes that they will deviate from when you wouldn't ordinarily think of doing that sort of thing, but this can just cause a, a switch to get flipped and you make a choice in an instant and your entire life swerves in a different direction. And I always think those, those moments of, of great tension and um, it, it's just bizarre to me how sometimes they will, they will present as opportunities to some people um, when other people are just trying to get through and trying to survive it. And you know, you'll have this really tiny group of people who instead use it as an opportunity to completely change themselves. Well, there has to be something awry in their life for mm -hmm. them to want to make. I mean, you're right. It has to Absolutely. be an almost instantaneous decision most of the time. Mm -hmm. But if they're going to disappear or if they're going to reappear as somebody else that they <laughs> presumably know has died or at least, you know, can grab all the stuff that identifies them, they probably have something going on in their lives mm -hmm. that, that, you know, caused them to think, wow, here's my moment. You know, I can change who yeah. I am. I mean, you know, you see that with, um, there were a number of imposters in the 19th century. Um, and one of the most famous was early on in the century, there was a young woman who turned up uh, claiming to be Princess Caribou, uh, you oh, know, from the island of Javasu, which doesn't exist. And, you know, she spoke kind of this made up uh, amalgamation language of different, <clears throat> excuse me, of different um different words, some taken from languages that actually existed, some just, you know, kind of cobbled together. And she convinced a number of people for a number of months that she was actually, you know, in, uh, royalty from the South Seas and managed to, to carry off this scam. And she was just a young woman who had a really crappy life. Yeah. You know, she didn't have education. She didn't have a whole lot of opportunities. She worked like a dog. There's um, speculation that she may have had um, a, 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 an issue with mental illness, and she just seized upon this as a way to step out of her life for a little while. And yes, absolutely, she she was scamming people. She she made a comfortable life out of it for a little while. You know, they they bought her silk clothes and they gave her a luxurious room to stay in at this beautiful estate. But there's a part of me that still thinks that she didn't do it just for the silk dresses and the, you know, the three square meals a day. I think there was a certain element of just wanting to get out of the sheer grim grinding drudgery of her life and be someone different. You know, I, it, it's, it's almost like she was Walter Mitty and didn't come back from one of her daydreams. Um, and, and you see that with a lot of these people. And I think I absolutely understand why a butcher from Australia would decide to try to be a baronet if he could, or, you know, why this, 
this young woman would, with no education and no real prospects, would claim to be a princess who didn't speak English. Um, you know, just for a little kindness. Yeah, I've always thought one of the most interesting people like that was the woman, I think her name was Anna, who claimed to be Anastasia, mm. um, the Romanov, the youngest of the Romanov sisters. Anna Anderson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I've always felt that with her, it was really a mental, I mean, I think it was not so much, it wasn't really for profit, it was for a mental condition or something. It I don't know. Was. I mean, I mean, you know, nobody ever, but of course it was blown away when Prince Philip agreed to um, mm-hmm. submit his DNA and they proved that um, the, the, the skeletons they found at Sarkozelo were in fact all of the Romanov children, all five, and, mm-hmm. and the Tsar and his wife. And so Anna couldn't be Anastasia. I mean, but, but part you know, of it too, I think, was that people really wanted to believe that one of them, because it was such a brutal execution. Oh, absolutely. And so, mm-hmm. you know, pointless. Um, she killed the girls. I mean, you know, that I think a lot of it was um, people wanted, it was like a fairy tale sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. You know, people wanted to believe that she had survived. But as you point out, today we have forensic tools that make it virtually impossible for any of this to happen. I mean, well, in the case in the case of Anna Anderson, I mean, she first came to to light when she attempted to commit suicide. Um, was in, it that? in Germany? Yeah, she jumped off a bridge into a canal and attempted to commit suicide, mm-hmm. and they fished her out and took her to a mental hospital. And it was when she was in the psychiatric ward after she'd been there for months, no one knew who she was. She, you know, she wasn't talking. That someone noticed her resemblance, what they thought was a resemblance to one of the czar's daughters in a magazine. And that's how the whole thing got started. It absolutely had its roots in a young woman who had been through a seriously traumatic experience, um, a number of them, and ended up so desperate that she she was attempting to kill herself. And I completely understand why in a, in a psych ward, she, if someone says, Hey, you know, this princess, is this you? I, sure. <laughs> but sure. You know, people, people want to hold on to this, even in the face of truth. And we, um, we traveled to Romania. I think it was, must've been 2018. Um, Lori King went with us, you know, she was researching one of her Mary Russell books. And anyway, so we're a group and um, Aunt Lori wanted to go to Transylvania. And, you know, there's there's a whole tour thing when you go to Romania mm-hmm. where you can go to Transylvania and visit Brand Castle, Dracula's Castle sure. and the whole thing. And what you find out when you go there is that actually Vlad was never there, that this was something dreamed up, believe it or not, by Americans in, I think, in the 1950s or something. But the myth has grown to the point where there are now, you know, whole tours that go to this little castle um, where... Actually, Queen Marie, I think it was the last queen of Romania lived. But but the whole the point is people want to believe mm-hmm. that is Dracula's castle, you know, and they it's just it's just amazing to me, you know, that that in the face of actual reality, people still want to hang on to that idea. And we love and our fairy a lot tales. Of mythology that I think survives not because the central figure necessarily wants wants it to be that way but because people want to you know they want to hold on to a myth i mean we could make an analogy to you know january 6th in some respects in that case you know what was it really and Mm -hmm. it's very hard to to you know truth can get bent and it's very hard to get people Mm -hmm. away from that because it's a well it's one of the most they want to buy into it's one of the most difficult and painful things to do is to, to look at something that you believed in and realize you were wrong and your, your, your faith was misplaced. And, and some people have a very hard time coming to grips with that. And, and you know, it, it's easier to continue to double down on your misplaced faith than it is to say, I made a mistake and, and you know, I feel foolish and I trusted where I shouldn't have, and I believed what I shouldn't have, and and now I'm a little older and a little wiser and a little more heart sore. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we do. We like to cling to our myths very hard.
Well, we do. And we like to, you know, we like to mythologize people or create icons out of people. I mean, we're in a celebrity driven society at the moment, which oh, makes sure. it even more difficult. But let's go back to the story because we've wandered a fight. Um, so Stoker <laughs> and Veronica, indeed, wishing to do a favor and wishing to see the tiger and, you know, do all that, arrive at the hall mm -hmm. <clears throat> and find that, in fact, there is a man there claiming to be Jonathan or not claiming, but, but not claiming Jonathan accepted by his grandmother. And, um, and unfortunately, we can't go any further without a giant spoiler. But Veronica has special knowledge um, that is really fascinating. And we learn it as we go along. Veronica was actually at the scene of Krakatoa mm -hmm. and survived, she was. was able to escape. But she was traveling in her party it was Jonathan mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other people. And so she's uniquely placed, as she can, to decide whether this man um, really is Jonathan, or if he's not, what's his story? And I love the way that you tease that out. Unfortunately, we can't discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the event is over, we can talk about it. When we're not live anymore, you I and know, I can talk You about know, it. this is one of those things where you'd really like to have a book club. Um, yeah. kind of a thing afterward or require yeah. everybody you know to yeah to read it well i appreciate you not giving spoilers i, I no, no, no. i'm not going to do that <laughs> um and i i thought i thought you did it with real artistry let me say that i Thank thought you. i thought Thank you, you did it much. extremely well and um it's an interesting chapter in fact in this unfolding relationship between stoker and veronica because while each book is indeed an individual investigation, you know, with a, a mm -hmm. fully realized mystery. The truth is that, you know, this is an ongoing story. It's this very mm -hmm. long overhead story arc and only Deanna, right. and even she may not know <laughs> where it's actually going. Yeah, um, you know, there, I've, I've known from the beginning certain things that were going to be doled out over the course of the, the arc of their story. And I've known where certain things were going to be doled out. And I, I, I try to alternate whose past we're dealing with so that right. it's not, you know, I didn't, in the very first book that I, that I wrote in the series, A Curious Beginning, I turned it into to the acquiring editor at, at Berkeley who had originally brought me into the fold. And she said, I love this, this is great. She said, but these 50 pages right here, she said, these were just for you. You need to take them out. She said, and then portion them out slowly because I had done basically an info dump of Stoker's entire past. And she said, that was for you. And that's great that you did that because now you know what it is. She said, but the reader doesn't need to know that that soon. She said, spread it up, keep it for later, keep a few things back. And it was such wonderful advice You bet. because it kept the focus of the first book squarely on Veronica. Um, and we really didn't get a lot of that information about Stoker's past until actually book three. I, I saved it longer than I expected. And there, um, there are characters that I have developed that, I mean, Tiberius, Stoker's older brother, didn't even hardly exist. Like, I think we mentioned him once in book one. We don't, we don't meet him uh, until book two. We don't really dig into his past until book four. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've got these, these personalities that are, that are shaping up and these relationships because Stoker and Veronica, like you said, they're, they're, they're barely domesticated. They are creating a, a found family for themselves. I mean, Stoker, Stoker is technically legitimate, but only because of the way English law works. I mean, everyone knows that the man who says he's Stoker's father is not Stoker's father. He gave him a name, but everybody knows that that's not, you know, all of this man's legitimate sons kind of line up next to each other. And Stoker was always the cuckoo in the nest. He was always made to feel different. And so Stoker and Veronica are assembling this found family, some of which includes Stoker's relatives kind of working their way back into his life after a period of, of decades away. And some of them are people like Julien Dorlon, who's the, the pastry chef, um, who's, um, I, I, I can't put his confections into every single book because they get, the books get too foodie. Yeah. Um, but I, I love Julian. And then JJ Butterworth, intrepid girl reporter, um, who one of these days is going to have to get a book that's devoted to JJ because I really want to let her off the leash 
one of these days and let her just kind of go to town on stuff. But um, so I, I, I always look at how to contain the mystery within that puzzle in that one book and then what pieces of what people uh, from this much bigger story get woven in. And it's always, it's such a fun balancing act to figure out, you know, who we're going to talk about in this book and what we're going to learn about them and how that's going to change their relationships because the relationships are constantly evolving throughout the series. And that's, that's turned out to be kind of an unexpected joy uh, in the series, because initially I was thinking just in terms of Veronica and Stoker's relationship. And I wasn't even plotting out this much bigger uh, found family motif that's going on, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. I enjoy that. Oh, I can tell you are. It is a lot of fun. But let me just say this, that, you know, many, many English marriages, British marriages among the upper classes, not just British, but um, across the aristocracy were really more about property. They were almost like, you know, Absolutely. real estate contracts. And so there was kind of an unspoken rule that if the first, generally two, children were actually legitimate, you know, were really the children of the male because mm -hmm. of the entail that we've already talked about. And it wasn't unusual for women, wives to have affairs, husbands to have affairs and office. They, they didn't marry for love in the first place. And exactly. you know, they kind of got along. And so, you know, they were, they, as long as the couple stayed married, it was always presumed legally that any children that the wife produced were in fact the children of the husband. And the husband's role Absolutely. was to, to go along with that and to acknowledge that there's a wonderful series by C.S. Harris, which you may or may not have read, which I truly love. And Sebastian St. Cyr mm -hmm. is in the same position as Stoker. Mm -hmm. You know, his mother clearly had an affair with somebody and his father, you know, um, went along, you know, gave him his name the whole bit. Then ironically, his older brothers died and so there he is, you know, the, the son that isn't really the son. Uh, right. And, and I, you know, in real life, that, that actually happened too. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. if you really went back into Ancestry.com and other stuff, you would find <laughs> that, you know, that that happened more often than not. So, oh, there's a lot of DNA that doesn't match. <laughs> yeah, no, there really is. So, I mean, while Stoker, yeah. you know, while it may be sort of common knowledge that Stoker isn't everybody isn't the legitimate son of the father. Yeah, Everybody goes exactly. along with it because legally, exactly. legally mm -hmm. he actually is. And it was only- Legally he is. Yeah. But, you know, different, different noblemen uh, and different gentlemen dealt with it in different ways. Some mm -hmm. of them took a very, very, you know, kind of urbane and sophisticated approach to the whole thing and just didn't bat an eye and didn't worry about it and figured, you know, okay, some of my kids are not mine, but some of my best friend's kids are not his because they are mine instead. So right. it'll all shake out in the wash. But, you know, others were a little bit more marked in their coolness towards the children they knew didn't actually belong to them. And um, it, that's always interesting to me too, to see which families it was understood and it was known you know, one of the um, uh, Dukes of Rutland early on in the 20th century, everybody knew that his youngest daughter was not his. She belonged to their neighbor. And it was something that was discussed a lot. And it was discussed sure. openly. Other families, it would never, ever be mentioned. It would never be referred to. And so it's always interesting to see who locks their skeletons up in the closet and who brings them out to dance. Well, that's true. And you also have to remember that divorce was an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, it's a very much, you know, 20th century kind of thing. So um, it wasn't the fact that the wife had an affair and produced a child or the husband had, you know, many mistresses and the whole bit was not grounds for divorce. It was really tough. And if you were no, in the aristocracy, you could only you know, actually it, get a divorce through an act of parliament, as I remember it. You can't, you could Up until the 1880s. The yeah, up until the 1880s. Uh, that's when that changed. But I mean, it, it still was incredibly expensive. It was difficult. It was scandalous. Yeah. And, you know, because of the fact that marriages were not usually entered into for romantic love anyway, they were arrangements between, you know, like minded people who were looking to secure their estate unto the next right. generation. It made perfect sense to say, OK, we'll produce a couple of, of kids who will secure this. And then we'll quietly and discreetly go about our business and you do you. And it was no reason to break up the family. 
um, because the family was bigger than just these two people. Exactly. You know, there was there was there was your place in history. There was your place in the story. And you know, it's really funny because when you go to any of these these grand stately homes in England, I, I remember walking into Castle Howard in Yorkshire, which is this massive pile yeah. of a house. I mean, any place else it would be called a palace because it is it is a small palace. It is remarkable. But I walked into that place just thinking, my God, the weight of history and responsibility. If you were the person who is the caretaker and you didn't ask for that job, you're born into it. You may not be good at it. You may not like it. But the weight of that responsibility to make sure that nothing disappears on your watch, that this house doesn't, you know, that, that, that you are a custodian that keeps it all together because most of these houses are they're tiny museums, you know, they, they hold the best and most exquisite craftsmanship that British artisans were, were capable of. And a lot of times continental artisans because they brought people over to work in the houses. But to see, you know, all of these, these gorgeous structures and all of the treasures that they're filled with and to know that it's on you to make sure nothing happens to that would be absolutely terrifying. I mean, I, it's, it's a wonder they don't all have, you know, gray hair at the age of 12. Well, it's back to the intel. Um, that's how they <laughs> manage to keep it alive. And this is also the reason why many marriages were all about money, because it took mm -hmm. an extraordinary amount of money to maintain these gorgeous places. And Well, that's you know, why Winston Churchill turned down a dukedom, is because it, he said, no, it's too expensive. I don't want, because you're expected to live in a certain style. Uh, you know, when, when, as you climb the, the ladder of, of nobility, your, your uh, way of life is expected to keep pace with that. And it's hideously expensive. And there's, um, uh, there was a wonderful book that came out years ago that broke down kind of the expenses that the average estate um, would incur. And you think about the fact that, oh, you know, Nanny's retired and she's got a cottage and then you've got the 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 old butler has been pensioned off and then we've got three maiden aunts and we've got you know four sisters who need dowries and it, you know and you start piecing it all together and realize it's an extraordinary ex expensive thing to do to keep a family together and to be the person who's providing for everybody especially when you don't work you know, the land is supposed to be making your money for you because it's not gentlemanly to go out and make money or to know too much about finance. Well, and that was a big conundrum in the 19th century when, mm -hmm. you know, farming and agriculture wasn't providing as much income. Where was the mm -hmm. money going to come from? But see, exactly. here's Stoker. So that's why you go off fact, and marry an American heiress. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. But think about Stoker. I mean, he, he is not the oldest son. The weight of all this does not fall upon him, but falls it upon his not. brother Tiberius. So, you know, he has, he's born into this family. They accept mm -hmm. him. You know, there's a certain amount of this and that that comes with him, but he is not forced to play the role that Tiberius has to play. Um, no, Tiber so. you know, Tiberius is the heir. He's taken up the mantle as Lord Templeton Vane. And then their second brother uh, has been knighted. He's, uh, Sir Rupert is in uh, law and diplomacy. And then you know, Stoker goes off and goes to the Navy for a while. And then the youngest brother goes into the church, uh, you know, as they did, because so many of the younger sons, I mean, Lord, that's another, another terrible fate for someone who doesn't have a vocation for the church at all to be told, okay, you have to, you, you have to shepherd a flock. Here's your living, you know, yeah. go enjoy your, your 200 pounds a year and, you know, good for you. <laughs> Well, you know, your timing was everything. <laughs> your place and your family um, had a lot to do with it. It wasn't based yeah. on merit, but rather <laughs> not at all position of your birth. But anyway, it leaves Templeton in a great position. And we have Veronica, who, who was illegitimate, whose father's never going to acknowledge her. And I'm not going to spoil it by saying <laughs> who her father is. You have to read the series. Um, but they're very much kindred spirits in lots of ways, have created a found family. Tim. Um, Stoker actually is divorced. He made a disastrous marriage. And, he is, he is and that was divorced. the subject of a book and a half anyway, um, mm. was to get him, you know, um, get him through that, however that worked out. And Veronica has not married so far. And amazingly, despite um, her rather active love life, is apparently <laughs> been pregnant. So, she you know, <laughs> no, which is really Veronica good knows a thing or two about. <laughs> 
about how so to prevent we're gonna, that. We're sort gonna of have thing. to leave them there in the hall <laughs> because if we go any further, there's no point you're reading the book. Uh, exactly. But I have to tell you, it's, it's really a lot of fun. And I think Deanna does a terrific job resolving oh, the various um, threads of the story. So why don't we bring Patrick up to see if we have any questions from people who Yay, might let's do. be watching. This Summon Patrick. Moment. There he is. <laughs> here I am. Um, let's see here. Excuse me. We've had a lot of comments about the, the whole people are loving the found family uh, in the book. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, well, can you give us, you were telling us a little bit before we went live about your next project. <gasps> yes. Can you tell us about it? I can. I have another book coming out this year. It is coming out in September, at the beginning of September. Um, it is my very first contemporary, so I am beyond excited about this. It's been in the works for a while. It is about what happens when four female assassins on the cusp of retirement have to band together to take out the organization they work for. So I have four 60-year-old female assassins who are kicking ass, and it is called Killers of a Certain Age. Oh, that's oh, fun. I'm going to love it. it. <laughs> I had just, I mean, a sinful amount of fun writing this book. And as soon as my husband read it, he said, oh my God, it reads like your Twitter feed. So if you follow me on Twitter and that's fun for you, you're going to want this book is all I'm saying. <laughs> if you're a Dorothy, if you're a Mrs. Polifax fan, if you're a Dorothy mm. Gilman fan, this, this could be a book for you. You know, I really it's, miss it's Mrs. Polifax. You know, that was I a do too. Series. I love Mrs. Po to me, this is, um, it's, you know what it is? It's a cross between it's Mrs. Polifax meets Modesty Blaze. That's oh, what that's it is. That's a great way to describe it. <laughs> love it. Okay. Anything else there, Patrick? Uh, let's see. Alana says, could we please get the J.J. Butterworth story? That would be amazing. Right? She has a big role so in this book. Fun. No, she does. J.J. is in this book in a fairly decent J. role. So that'll be J.J. is in this book. I do. I, I love I love writing about J.J. She is um, she is one of those characters who did not feature in the um, I don't even think she was in the second book. I don't think she turned up until book three. And I absolutely have the best time writing her. Um, she's just, um, she is, she's got a lot in common with Veronica. The fact that she's trying to make her way in a world that is, is not always encouraging to her, but, um, but she's very much her own person. And I love the fact that they, again, it's a frenemy sort of situation. Um, you know, they don't quite trust each other, but they, they have a natural bond. So yeah, I think JJ definitely needs her. I need to run a contest and see what people think JJ stands for. Good point. <laughs> Any possibility of a, of a TV version of the Speedwell series? Um, never say never. never, say I, never. I, I have actually, um, I have turned down a couple of offers um, because it's the sort of thing that I would want it to be with the right folks to do it. And um, my feeling is once I sign away the entertainment rights to Veronica, that that would then become their story to tell. Um, and I don't want to be involved in adapting or writing it. So I want to make sure that whoever has their hands on it is ready to hit the ground running and absolutely loves it and wants to take charge. So I think that's a very wise approach. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see, Jean wants to know, is Deanna working on the next Veronica story? I am, I'm writing Veronica 8 right now and I am under contract for Veronica 9. Yay, oh, really good news. I forgot to mention that when we get to September, we will certainly, I hope we will see Diana here at the Poison Pan. Oh, I hope so yeah. too. Yep. I hope so well, too. Fingers crossed that travel will happen. Um, and I would absolutely love that. This is gonna be a really fun book to travel. Uh, with be. and yeah. to, to introduce to people. So I'll stick it in our system in case any of you want to order it early, which we find people want to do. Um, so it is we'll available be... for pre-order now. Oh, excellent. All right. We'll, we'll take care of that then. Anything awesome. else, Patrick? Uh, let's see. I keep asking. Um, no, this is your chance, folks. Uh, well, someone very kindly says, um, I ordered my signed copy. Thank you so much for being the coolest bookstore on the planet. Thanks, Tammy. That's really nice. That's very nice. But well, we can only do that because Diana, Diana is such a wonderful author and has 
kindly signed all of these books for us. And, you know, during the pandemic, I have many unfortunately boxes. during the pandemic, what's happened is we've turned authors into shipping clerks, which is not really what they were designed to do. So it's a real pain for them to have all these books dumped on their doorstep. And we really appreciate the fact that they've been willing to take them inside and unbox them and sign them and box them back up and send it to us. Cause you know what? Really I'm, good. I'm thrilled that there is an option available where people can get books signed. Um, you know, I, whether it's uh, a couple of stores I've, I've done book plates for poison pen is the one store that has copies that are physically fully signed. The others have oh, got right. book plates. So if it makes a difference to you, poison pen is going to be the one place that you can get uh, a book that's, that's signed completely. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to do that. Cause I know, I know some folks really like that. Well, thank you, Diana. We couldn't have done it if you hadn't agreed to do that. And <laughs> we have in fact spent two years <laughs> shipping books all over, all over. Um, it's been, I don't think my UPS man likes me. <laughs> probably not. I'm, I'm sure we can, I go down to the store when I pull into the parking lot, looking at the bookstore, okay. there are row upon row upon row of those pubs <laughs> from the post office. You know, those white, what, are, what do oh, we yeah. do before them? And, you know, I don't there. know, but I've been at the back door of your store. I know well, what it looks like when you have heaps and heaps and heaps. We do. But, you know, <laughs> thank God there's a system that actually works yeah. that um, enables us to keep it going until we can go back to real time. We are, we are doing Absolutely. more live events. Um, I'm seeing many you more. I'm seeing more and home. more stores starting to gradually open, which is why right. I've really got my fingers crossed that in September, it's going to be doable and I'll be able to actually get back into the stores. And, you know, the, the book tour that I did in 20, March of 2020 was the final event for a lot of stores because yeah. I, as I went across the country, they were all closing right behind me. And so it's going to, it's going to feel really, really good to get out there. I love doing virtual events because it means that people can tune in from all around the world, which is fantastic. I also love doing in person. So I'm, I'm hoping to get the best of both worlds moving forward that you know we can do hybrid. I know the pen has, I think for a long time, you guys have-, have Over 20 years. Online. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're actually, all of our live events are also streamed. And I YouTube love that. And, and, I, and I think you were one of the first stores to do that, uh, which I think yeah. is fantastic because it gives everybody the option whether they live in gorgeous, warm Scottsdale or not, the, the opportunity to, to come and enjoy an event, which is, I think, yeah, really I'll find in early September that gorgeous, warm Scottsdale is actually blistering hot, uninhabitable Scottsdale. And therefore, okay, oh. maybe, maybe we'll go virtual. <laughs> it's fine. It's uh, fine. No, we've, we've been, we've, um, we have, we have, we usually come in February. I don't, no, September February is going to be a rude reason. awakening. <laughs> I got some we actually created a studio where um, we, we did a really tricky in-store virtual live event on Tuesday night. And Patrick has really come a long way in working out how we can manage all that. And we also do podcasts of our events. So for people, yeah. you know, who don't want to sit down and watch one, they can actually listen to the conversation. Oh, that's fantastic. So it's been, a, it's it. been an interesting and very creative time. It has. Well, yeah. you know, anything that makes things more accessible for readers, yeah. I think is But the is bottom line is fantastic. we couldn't do any of this without authors like Deanna who've been willing to go along with it and do the hard work of signing the my books and pleasure. showing up on Zoom and all the rest Absolutely of it. So we are pleasure. so grateful to them. So we've had, we've had a little flurry of questions oh. come in. <laughs> so that's good. Um, hit me, Patrick, hit me. Yes, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> one of them is, um, <laughs> Alana says, uh, non-book related, what is that divine lipstick color? <laughs> um, okay, I'm trying to remember what I put on tonight. Um, I think this is YSL, uh, the Yves Saint Laurent. Um, tell her I will double check and see, and I will put it on Twitter when the event is over. But I will, give her, I will give her the exact color when we're done. Oh, great. Um, let's see. Same, Alana. She says, I'm still thinking of J names. All I have so far is <laughs> Josephine, which is a great J name. Josephine? We'll see. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Our friend Christina um, says, does Deanna have a favorite book in her series? Ooh, that's a horrible question. <laughs> Oh, they're all asking children. about your favorite child. Um, you know what? It is. It, 
usually my favorite one is whichever one I'm working on at the time uh, because I'm so invested in that one. And my least favorite one will be whichever one I just finished because I spent so much time with it. Looking back on the series, I do have a very, very soft spot for um, A Treacherous Curse because that was my first Edgar nomination. And I absolutely screamed the house down when that phone call came in because that was, um, that was probably the single award nomination. And I've been, I've been very fortunate to have a lot, of, a lot of lovely things come my way. But that Edgar nomination probably means more to me than any of the others because of the fact that it was the first time really within the mystery community that it's a very established award. It's a, it's a prestigious award. And it was the mystery community saying, hey, you're one of us. And I just absolutely lost my mind when that nomination came in. And I said straight up, I do not need to win this award. This nomination means everything to me. And sure enough, I did not win the award. <laughs> but it meant a that lot. That was fine. That was fine. I went to the banquet and had a great time. So that was all I needed. Kathleen uh, asked, she says, Deanna, are you in love with Stoker too, as most of your readers are? <laughs> Actually, no, um, because he's, he's, he's fully fictitious. Um, he, I, I love him in that I love all my characters. Um, I, I put, um, he does have a number of qualities that my husband does. So um, there, there are some similarities there. Uh, but um, we, I just won't tell you which ones they are. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, yeah, Christina says, if you ask about the lipstick color, please ask Barbara about her drink, per Mayo's order. Oh, um, <laughs> what, well, what are you turns, drinking, Barbara? It turns out that, you know, it, I'm drinking wine, but it could be <clears throat> actually any liquid. This is a Delheim Rosé from South Africa, which Rob and Ooh, I yeah. found when we were traveling there, which we have discovered you can actually import into the United States, and we love it. Um, but the idea is that you, you need to keep your throat hydrated if you're not going to completely lose your voice. And, you know, one of the penalties of growing older is that things don't work like they did when you were younger. So you have to kind of deal with that. I don't, I don't think wine was what they prescribed, just liquid. <laughs> uh, let's see here. What else do we have? But you've iced it. That's hydrating. I have. Um, and... You know, I'm, I'm a person who, if I'm not drinking red wine, really likes everything to be cold. And it horrifies <laughs> a lot of people when I drop ice cubes into my wine, but I don't like water. This is part of my problem. I really <laughs> don't like water. So it's my way of kind of, you know, getting myself into more of a hydrated state, which in Arizona is not a bad thing. I was going to say, you live in a desert. We do. So you have to kind of keep that in mind, right? So Patrick, is there anything else it. or should we thank oh. everybody? Yeah, let's thank everybody. All right. So let me remind you that we do have an increasingly small number of copies of The Impossible Imposter. And look at this gorgeous cover. I mean, isn't it beautiful? They do such a nice job. I they love really the Berkeley have, Art yeah. Department. They're so good to me. And I will um, I will put De Deanna's um, amazing September book um, on order, autographed copies in our system. So you can pre-order that. And it's exciting to know that she's working on Veronica in Stoker number eight with number nine to follow. So I am good news for you fans. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Deanna, what a pleasure to see you. Enjoy the rest of your book tour. Oh, thank you so much. I love getting to come and visit with everybody at the pen. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the book love.